Okay. Counting down those last few seconds so we can start up for everybody. We've got a, quite a bit of people already here, so that's good. We're going to try and uh, cover a lot of ground in this session. This is not the usual kind of session. This is not a how-to, more of a how to fix things um, and think about the future. So welcome to SEC 103, TOTP, Tips, Tweaks, and Troubleshooting, or as I like to call it, things you haven't thought about yet, but you probably needed to beforehand. This session is going to not be a typical install session. This is going to be about real life episodes, um, issues, fixes, problems, all kinds of things related to TOTP. Um, regarding the environments we have specifically related to Domino T TOTP. Uh, my name is Keith Brooks. I'm going to be your host for the 45 minutes. Remember to go listen to our sponsors, visit their uh, sessions, look at their uh, apps and, and work with them. They're great people. Some of them have done excellent work over the years. OpenNTF provides the open source templates and uh, scripts and things like that that all of us have provided to help future generations of admins and developers. And for anybody who uh, wants to get an alternative view of Domino TOTP, Sci1, uh, the bottom right corner sponsor, uh, had an MFA option before HCL produced one in R12. So that's the only alternative I'm going to mention about that. For those who don't know who I am, I've been around for a long time, was an IBM champion for many years, HCL ambassador, uh, part uh, author of the Quicker Admin book, OpenMTF uh, contributor. I did a tip a day for a year under HCL ambassador tips at one point, uh, read some exams, and you'll notice the year is 2022 because I'm actually working on the current round of domino questions for the new certification for R12. So any of the questions that you think are crazy and you don't like, those aren't mine. Any the ones you do like, I'll take. Um, I'll accept on some of those. So today we're gonna to talk about TOTP, time-based one-time passwords. But we're actually gonna talk about specific things like how Traveler, Verse, Nomad, applications and TOTP all come together and work together in a way that you can offer your clients or if you're, you are the client, then what you're looking at for that future as you try and roll this out. We're gonna talk about topical but important ideas and things to remember and consider as we get through this. Um, it's, it's, you know, when you read the instructions, so to speak, it's relatively simple, but it's really not when you break it down all the parts that you need. And not everybody's environment is ready for all those steps. And that's what we're going to talk about. The ID vault importance is key because you probably have ignored your ID vault all this time. And going forward, it's going to become basically the master of your domain. Because everything for TOTP is based on the ID vault works and is up to date. Testing TOTP is not always the simplest process. There's firewall things in between, there's you know, user device issues, there's logins, there's ID issues, lots of stuff. And while there isn't a specific slide dedicated to the topic, it actually is across all the slides we're going to have a piece of, we're going to talk about things that happen at different times. And we're going to talk about troubleshooting TOTP, error messages that occur, real life incidences, questions from the forums, questions from the HCL ambassador forum. Uh, and all of this is real life. Over the last year or so, I've probably done at least a dozen of these. So there's a lot of real life info I've got and experience. Uh, if you were at Engage, uh, two of the HCL guys were doing this session and I was giving them answers because unfortunately they weren't giving people the right information based on what the product does. And it's not their fault. You know, when you're internal to the company and you've got a demo environment, your product works one way, but in the real world, we have to work a very different way sometimes. So um, this session was kind of born out of some of the discussions from there and some other discussions I had over the last year. This session, however, is not going to cover how to set up and install TOTP, okay? You can go read the docs, the information's out there, 
you don't really need a session to do this. In fact, last year I did the session, I collapsed for 2021 and covered not only how to do the install, how to customize the MFA login screen, how to get IDs into the ID vault, and if there were errors for it. And in June this year, I did a what's new of TOTP for 1201 when I was at SUTO in Prague. So I'm not going to touch on all that stuff. We'll mention pieces of it, but the session really is not about how to do it. So if that's what you want, there's an HCL Academy video, there's my sessions, um, there's lots of ways to do it. So let's move on. The first reason why most of you are going to be rolling out TOTP is because of your insurance or your customer's insurance, compliance, security, whatever you want to call it, right? But in all honesty, if they didn't have a need, most customers wouldn't even bother. Most of them would never probably leave hard and night, which is what we saw. So you get this request, you know, if you're the business or whatever you are, and they say, well, you know, we need cyber insurance and we must have an MFA for anything from the outside that comes in. And my first question always is to my customers, show me the technical guidance. There isn't one. It's an insurance company. They're not a technical company, right? So you have to kind of play the game. You have to say, okay, sure. We can check a box and say we've done something, but do you have details? Do you have things we're supposed to do? And the answer really is they don't. Because if they did, they'd be asking you to have an MDM, which most people haven't always set up. And they'd probably tell you to stop using SSO, which is basically one of the most unsecure ways to live your life. But of course we create SSO and we use it because we're trying to make users' lives easier. And as we go through this session, you're gonna see some aspects where the balance of security, user ease and, and practicality are all gonna mesh in different ways. So the question that always comes up is, you know, we need an MFA, but do we? Notes has an MFA by default, right? If you're not using SSO on a Windows machine, you've got a front end login on Windows, which is a separate entity and directory in some cases. And then you've got a separate login in Notes with your ID and your password. That's an MFA straight off and done, right? Check the box. Your phone has an MFA by default also. These days, new phones have a, you know, pin code, a slide, a, uh, you know, a fingerprint, an eye, whatever, right? Just to get into the phone. Then on the app, you've got a login and password. You've got tokens involved. You may or may not also have a separate, you know, uh, fingerprint or something to it. So the question of do we need TOTP for Traveler, Verse, whatever, by the way, I'm going to probably keep calling Traveler and Verse the same thing, just letting you know. Do we need it for Verse? My attitude is no, and you don't want to use it for first. We're going to get to that in just a second. But you're going to have insurance company telling you you must have it because anything coming from the outside must have it. Okay, so if that's the case, then you go back and you say, what do you want to do with that? Uh, but before we get to all that, I want to make something really clear about TOTP, okay? And Repeat after me, TOTP for Domino is URL defined. It's not server or application defined. However, the setup and installation is server defined, but how a user interacts with TOTP starts with a URL always, every time. There is no other way to do this. So the simple answer when someone says, do we need TOTP across the whole server? The answer is, well, yes, but no, right? It has to be installed on an R12 server, but it's URL defined. The URL is just letting you into the server. And from there, you can point people to whatever you want. Point them to the iNotes redirector. Point them to a login portal. Point them to a specific app. Doesn't matter. It's all about the URL, right? So that's the big thing that I try and get across to people. And every customer has this same misunderstanding about how it all works. And I'm gonna give some examples now. And by the way, the question, the, anybody has questions, you can put them here. I've got a separate laptop for the questions. I'll try and get to them as I see them. So I'm gonna assume for the moment, everybody on this session has not done TOTP and may not know all the steps. So I've taken some screenshots and this one is the um, website doc for my domain. 
And as you can see, when you're looking at TCP authentication and TLS, you have yes, no for name and password, and then you've got yes for TOTP. All you end up doing in TOTP is creating a, a website or URL. And if you set this to yes with TOTP, then TOTP is turned on for that URL, plain and simple. You know, you have to have configured the server, but basically it's ready to go. If you say no, or you just say yes for name and password, then there's no TOTP, right? Pretty simple. On the bottom right here, you've got the TOTP configuration checker report. This comes from the top button, which is new in the templates. You click on TOTP configuration check, and you'll get an answer that says TOTP appears to be configured correctly with your domain. If not, go look at the user and, and verify. When you go to a person doc in, in the 12 template and 1201 template, you get the same button on top and you get to find out if that user is correct. So you, you now have a server correct and a user correct, which is nice because if you have problems between the two, at least you have a way to find out what's happening. So that's all fine and good and really exciting, right? But now we wanna talk about structuring the URLs and why do we structure them the way we do? So in this chart, I tried to give some logic. Hopefully it makes sense. The first two lines are your typical mail users. And for the sake of argument, we're gonna say these are first webmail I know it's users. The second two are applications, doesn't matter what application. The la next to last one is travel or verse, and then the last one is nomad. So first, starting at the top with mail, you've got users who are internal, users who are external. TOTP required, is it required for internal? Probably not. Could you do it? Of course, it's just a URL. So I've made an example of mail.company.com. At the second level, right, for external people coming in, whether it's your own employees or if it's a third party coming in, TOP will be required. So now we want a different URL called webmail.company.com, right? Simple, but separate. They both go to the same server or servers, and no one, is, nothing is actually being TOTP'd except those external people will get the prompt to set up the MFA. The application side, most of the time internally, people aren't going to use TOTP for internal access. So I created appn.company.com. And then applications from the outside for people who come in or have integrations that need to work with certain apps or, or give you data, and you do need it, you're going to make it appt.company.com. You can call these anything, obviously. They're just URLs. You put them in your DNS and in the firewall and allow them to work, and that's what's important. Traveler is where the fun starts because Traveler, right, isn't usually an external application. Some people use it internally, but usually it's, it's an external process through the gateway out your firewall. So TOTP is required, yes and no, right? And, of course, the domain usually is traveler.company.com, right? But, of course, it could be anything. So why is it yes or no? And the answer is because we don't know where we're going with um, the traveler yet, right? Because you may say, well, we have to have it. And it has to be TOTP. And you may say, well, we don't, right? And there's other information to think of, right? For one, uh, and I'm going to just skip for a second to the nomad part, right? If you want nomad, internal or external doesn't matter, right? you may or may not want TOTP, but Nomad isn't gonna work with Domino TOTP. However, Nomad will work with HCL SafeLinks version of TOTP, uh, as well as some others. So, um, and I put this here because people started asking me about how they're gonna get Nomad in here and I was trying to explain it to them. And so I figured other people would wanna know, right? So Nomad doesn't require the TOTP, but of course, if you're, compliance needs it, your security needs it, insurance needs it, you're going to need it, but you're not going to be able to fly through Domino for it. Okay. So let's go back to the Traveler part for a second. Does Traveler need TOTP? On the left, reasons for TOTP. They're pretty basic. Insurance, compliance, security. On the right, a lot of reasons not to do it or not use it, right? The biggest one is if the whole point of TOTP and the MFA is to ensure security, how does that help 
if it's on my phone and I lose my phone and someone's got my phone and they were able to figure out my, you know, keypad up front. Now they're in my phone, they're getting the MFA, they can get access to everything. So what's the point of putting the TOTP on trial work for that reason? There really isn't, right? Uh, support tickets will go up because people aren't going to be able to type it properly. People are going to get uh, prompted. They're going to ask, why are they getting prompted? They're going to have all kinds of things. You know, initially, this is what happens. It's a big spike. Eventually, people understand and hopefully they get through it. But they're going to start getting locked out because they're going to keep typing and then realize, oh, it's a cap. It's this. It's that. Help desk calls. Help desk tickets. Right? Downside. Uh, if you don't if you don't uh, configure TOTP properly, then every time they want to get mail on their phone, they actually have to put in the MFA just to have it sync to get mail, which is crazy, right? No user in their right mind is ever going to put up with that, right? So you have to kind of think about that. And there's an INI setting we could talk about later that that gets around that a bit. Uh, the ID vault may not be updated for everybody, as I said, depending on your environment. The ID vault is everything. So maybe the person's there, maybe they're not. If they don't have an ID in the ID vault, TOTP will not work for them no matter what you try and do. So there, there's things you're going to find out along the way. And again, more support tickets. And the last one is SAML is not supportive for TOTP. So if you're relying on traveler accessing um, through SAML, uh, uh, logging in through SAML, you're kind of out of luck. So Back to the question of should Traveler have TOTP, my stance is no. Of course, I've been in sessions where people have argued, of course, you should have it. But I'm pretty sure those guys have never given any thought to whether a normal user would have it because they probably don't even have to do it. I actually, on my phone, I actually do it because I'm testing for my personal server aspects of TOTP. One of them is this idea that if I have to log in, what happens? How often do I have to log in? Uh, and I'm noticing a bunch of things, which actually I need to open a, another SPR with HCL about. Um, so that's the aspects of Traveler and TOTP that may or may not come into question, but usually people, that's the first thing is they're like, well, we have to put on travel. My first answer always is, no, you don't. And you really don't want to, unless there's some really, really huge reason that you must. And most of the time the customers have agreed with me, but feel free to give me any feedback otherwise. So a bit on the SAML TOTP, you know, a customer wants to use SAML for users for Windows computers, but they want to have TOTP for other devices. That's cool, right? As we already talked about, you set up multiple URLs, no problem, right? TOTP goes to one, SAML goes to the other, not an issue, right? This works real well when you've got a simple environment, you know, uh, a client or a customer who has to log in one way, internal people log in another, uh, maybe one app or, or whatever. But if you've got a mesh of stuff where your people have to log in here and there and other people have to log in here and there, you're going to get into a mess very quickly. And you really need to think this out and plan this out in a way that makes sense for people. It's not a bad thing to tell people if you're on your mobile device or a tablet, go through this URL. And if you're on Windows, go through another. You know, if you want, you could just tell people, um, you know, internal will do this, external will do that. You want to make it as simple as possible to people, which, of course, reminds me, do not create really insane URLs for people. I actually have a customer who wants to use like some kind of crazy name. It's like INC, ABGK. So I'm like, how am I supposed to ever remember that? And he's like, oh, well, you just bookmark it. I'm like, just make it a simple URL, you know, make users' lives easy, not hard. So try and think about that as you're going to create these URLs. And for those who don't understand why SAML is not supported, it comes straight from the HCL documentation from this link. I grabbed the, the screenshot. TOTP is not supported with basic authentication or SAML. Pretty straight from the horse's mouth, so to speak, right? Uh, so that's why on session authentication, it's either single server or multiple. I've used both and they both work pretty well. It's pretty nice. The most common is single server because uh, smaller customers do it that way. Bigger customers, of course, end up with multiple server. So Nomad and TOTP. So let's catch up for a second with that, right? So who's ready for Nomad, right? I've got a customer who actually thinks it's pretty cool, wants to try and roll it out, and they're going to need TOTP. 
But sorry, that's not going to happen with domino side because I was informed that HCL has no plans to change this. So what do you do? The answer was Nomad will work with other TOTP offerings and we should suggest that you use the HCL safe links, uh, which is fine. You know, I think that's great that we keep it in-house. It's depressing that Domino couldn't be the TOTP for Nomad, but I understand it's probably architectural reasons and development code purposes. But if you'd like to see Domino TOTP work with Nomad, go vote for it at this aha idea. I did not submit the aha idea. Someone else beat me to it. So um, that's just one of the things that, that comes up. And, you know, but Nomad is starting to be of interest to people. And I wanted people to understand that the TOTP we have from Domino is not going to play nicely with it. So that's that's the update on that. So now let's go take a look at ID vaults. All right, we talked about the URLs, which is important for TOTP. Now we're going to talk about who needs IDs, how, why, and what to do. This is actually the hard part, believe it or not. And I'm going to explain why. So like the last chart, right, we've got internal, external users, mail, right, notes, I notes first. And by ID file in the vault, I'm saying, is there an ID file in the vault already? Right. So for the first two, the answer is yes. Right. Because nine times out of 10, you create a mail user. Here's an ID. And if you have the ID vault in existence, there's an ID in the ID vault. Right. And so therefore, the next step is set up a URL for them to get access and then set up TOTP. Right. Nice and simple. Straight out of the box, vanilla kind of function. The next two, you're talking about internal people who are in, and external who are not in the ID file who don't have an ID file in the ID vault, right? So how does that ID file get there? This is really an interesting dilemma. So when you have a notes client, for those who don't know, and you've got an ID vault and you've recertified people or made changes on their IDs or whatever it is, every time they log in, that ID gets checked. And if it's a new update, it gets pushed out to the ID vault. So for notes people, it's real simple, right? But on the website, not so simple, right? Why? Because they don't have an ID attached to their web browser usually, right? So what do you do, right? And on the flip side, if I've got external, um, you know, let's say I've got third-party customers who are coming into our site to get mail from us, right? Secured mail, right? So we created there. But what happens if the ID vault was the ID vault was broken, or maybe something? These people were so old they never made it, or who knows what, right? What do we do? So you're going to end up creating the URL like usual. You may or may not have to create an ID vault or at least possibly fix it or recreate it. You're going to upload an ID via CSV or wait for the person to log in if you can get them to log in from a notes client and then set up TOTP. That part about the ID via CSV, right? We're not actually uploading an ID. What we're doing is we're basically re-registering the user. And when we re-register the user, assuming our ID vault is now in place and properly set up, then that person would then get registered properly, have a proper mail account, all the information, the ID would be there, and we follow the proper configurations. You allow notes-based programs to use a notes ID vault, like set for the iNotes people, and everything should be great and, and dandy, right? So mail generally is relatively easy when it comes to TOTP and the ID vault. Right. Occasionally there are people who aren't there or things got corrupted so you can fix a person. Right. But it's not so simple when you're talking about a whole bunch of people on the outside who are not employees who need access to an application you have. This is where the fun part starts. So for the sake of argument, this is all about applications um, and this is real life. Right. I have a customer. I had to figure out how to get 3,000 external people who are only application users into their ID vault. Not so simple. And I'm going to explain why. So internal and external people using applications, if there are files in the, in the ID vault, everything's good, right? Set up a URL, set up TOTP, and off you go. But what happens if you need access to the applications and those internal and external people are not in the ID vault. Now, internal people, I'm not sure why they would not be in the ID vault, right? Because internal people, you'd think they were registered properly. But here's the thing. 
most customers who had external people coming into their Domino environment prior to R12, actually, I probably should say prior to R9, since most people don't update from 9 to 12, they only made person docs. They just added a person. They didn't register the people, right? And there's obviously two reasons for that. One was they didn't want to pay, which is a whole other discussion I'm not going to get into about licensing, which I've had to fight with a couple of customers. And the other is, um, you know, they just, you know, they figure, well, they didn't need to register them because at the time you could authenticate against the name and address book very easily, right? That all changed in R12. You can't do that anymore. You actually have to do things a certain way that are more secure. So now we have a problem. So what do we do? So of course, back to our set up the URLs, we know where what domain we're using. We now have to create an ID vault possibly on that gateway server people are coming in on, right? So we may have an internal company ID vault. We may have an external ID vault, right? That's fine. We can have multiple ones, right? Here comes the fun part. Upload the ID via CSV and then set up TOTP. So on the bottom of the screen, you can see, right, that the CSV file in details, I wrote a big long blog post, which actually included a blog post I wrote 12 years ago about using the CSV file to register people. My updated post from last year talks about how uh, unfortunately, it's great that HCL gave us TOTP in R12 and updated the ID vault and some other things. Unfortunately, registration process hasn't changed since R5 for whatever unknown reason. So you cannot go and register someone and put their ID in the ID vault if you're trying to register them without mail. It just won't do it. Notes will, the, the Domino admin client will sit there and change all the background configuration. And all you're doing is making a glorified person doc if you don't tell it you're using Notes or iNotes. This is one of the stupidest things that I've seen yet. So I made an aha idea on the bottom to try and fix some of these. So how do you get around it? So with my 3,000 people, I created the CSV and I did it by customer because it was easier to make sure we got one customer done at a time. And I took the customers, filled out the names, emails, and they were already in the address book, don't forget. But what we wanted to do is we wanted to maintain that info, including their passwords and other stuff, and re-register the people on top. So this get, got a lot more trickier than I thought it would too. So what we ended up doing was creating like a second edition of the people, right? We had the original one up there, and now we recreated a brand new one. Their IDs went in. Right, we created their ID. We created mythical mail files and we created a mythical notes or iNotes user, right? But they're not mythical because Domino thinks they're real, right? So I got them loaded up, put them in, CSV does it, everybody comes out fine, great. Then I have agents I wrote that go in and change notes to other internet mail or none, depending on what we were doing. I have agents that go and basically wipe out any reference to the mail file. I have a different agent that goes and copied over the password from the old doc to the new one. And I also had one that had to copy their info from the old info to the new one. Because you can't overwrite the old one because it's not a real document. This all gets really confusing, but when you break it all down and follow the, the blog post I wrote, you kind of understand what's happening. So we get through all that and push people back up together and all that. Oh, and by the way, you have to go into the Domino admin client, go into files, go into the mail to directory I created where all these dummy mail files went and delete all those, right? Suffice it to say, it was not a fun exercise, but it is possible. But this is starting to become more and more of an issue. And it'd be nice if HDL would actually give some thought to this registration process and help all these customers who are suddenly trying to figure out how to get all these people um, created properly given that they already existed, right? But okay, enough of my soapbox. So now that we got all that done, right, so to speak, and we're gonna talk some more about it, there's certifier ID and passwords, right? Because to set up TOTP, you need the cert and you need the password. You don't need it for long. It has to sit on the server for a few minutes while it does the basic configuration, then you can take it off. Of course, I had a customer who says, well, we don't know where the cert ID is or we don't know the password. So if you thought the best thing to do is create a new cert and cross-certify everything and do it all, that was one way to do it. 
uh, in a small environment that kind of worked real well. Uh, the other way was if you had a CA set up, there is a way to reverse out your ID and passwords. So I'm not advocating this as a way to hack into Domino because you still had to be inside Domino and be an admin, et cetera, to get there. But there are ways to take that hash and reverse it back out and figure out the passwords. So there are things that happen, but again, this is stuff that happens that nobody thinks about when they're trying to get TOTP configured, right? You know, you read, the, read what to do, but it doesn't always jive with what's going on in your head about what you're gonna do when it's time. The easiest way to do some of the, to, to roll out TOTP actually is to do best practice, which is have a dev, a dev environment and a prod environment or a qual environment, whatever you wanna call it, right? Because then you take the old one, you boost it up to 12, you put everything on there, you test it all out in, in the fake domains and all that stuff. And now you know exactly what you got to do when you get live, right? But a bunch of you kind of live dangerously and just have one server and, you know, you want to do all this on the fly. So you may or may not be also trying to upgrade Windows at the same time, which I would advise you do because it'll make it cleaner and easier by having a separately new box to install Windows, then install the new R12, you only need to pull the base minimum files from the R9 server to the 12 server, you know, NAB and, you know, miscellaneous things like admin 4 and that stuff, and, and start building your process and make sure it's not replicating back to the R9 box, okay? You don't want that because basically R9, 10, and 11 do not mix very nicely with R12, okay? there There is... Um, template changes, there are view changes, there are field changes, there's all kinds of stuff in the R12 template of the address book, the ID vault, uh, and Domino CFG that will just wreak havoc on your R9 environment. So do not let it replicate back and forth. Once you build the servers, then you can move your data and you can clean stuff up, right? But how do you move your ID vault, right? This becomes a question for people that comes up because, you know, people don't always think about that. So the ID vault um, is kind of funny, right? So you want to replicate the ID vault, which is possible, right? You don't use file replica. You actually use a, a command from the ID vault manage system. That's the first link here. You've got, uh, if you run into problems, there's what to do about a lost ID vault ID and password. <laughs> the simple answer is you're going to have to create a new one. Um, the, the last link on this page is changing the original password, I thought it would help us figure out how to change the password, kind of like you do in WebSphere. You know, when you don't have a certain password, you can go in and change something. No, there's no way to do it. So how many of you remember when you created your ID vault, A, what you did with the ID file, and B, what the password was that you created for this ID file that you had no reason to use? Yeah, well, guess what? Time has come. And guess what also? The ID vault expires after 10 years. What the hell was that about? I have no idea. And I'd love someone to tell me because there is really no reason for this to expire at all, but it does. So the first two articles here explain to you how to correct that. Uh, one is more technical, one is more business technical, depending on who you need to read or what you want to do. And you need this because if you're gonna create that new environment of the R12 and move the R9 stuff to 12, the ID vault has to come with you. And so you need that password for that ID that suddenly you have no idea what it is and where it is and why, why you have it and what to do with it. So as it turns out, it's usually in one of two places. Um, it's either on the client machine that created the ID vault, which if you're using like a jump box or some kind of admin PC, that's probably fine, it's still there. But if that machine's moved on or if some admin did it who moved on, you're probably out of luck. Second place is it may or may not be on the server itself. I found it on one, I didn't find it on another. So it is what it is. So again, you may end up having to create the ID vault all over again. Not the end of the world, but it happens. So on top of that, as I've ran into with one customer, the ID Vault admins didn't exist. They had a bunch of people in there who don't exist anymore. Um, the actual admin who was the admin now wasn't even in there. He was the previous admin once. So you need to keep this stuff up to date. Um, in theory, you should be doing this at least once a year when you do your compliance audits and all that. 
Um, but if not, here's the steps to go in and do password reset and to add remove vault administrators. Uh, if you're using a uh, admin ID instead of a person ID, it's highly recommended to do that because then you don't have to worry about that disappearing, but you do have to worry about that expiring. So always make sure those IDs are like good for like a hundred years. I'm sure someone's going to complain about my theory on that, but honestly, you know, over time it does help. <coughs> so uh, brief information about notes I and I. Okay, I wasn't really going to go heavy into this, but I realized this slide kind of was needed. I've used this slide now four or five times in presentations over the last year, because the first one, TOTP underscore step size, is what gives your users more time than 30 seconds to look at their phone, get the MFA, go back to their device, type it in, screw it up, go back, do it again, and do it again, right? I kind of advocate you should set this to 60 seconds instead of 30, which is a default because users are not as fast as IT people. And also a lot of them don't remember. So they're literally going A, one, two, four, and you can see where this happens, right? And next thing, support desk calls. You don't want support desk calls, raise the step size. And the second one is, um, and this is gonna come out later, the time skew if your server and your clients are off in time by more than a minute or more than 30 seconds, actually, either way, then you're gonna have problems with registering those users. Um, and that's kind of what's the way it works. I haven't really been able to deal with that yet because it's kind of hard to judge whether someone's really far off or not. Most people I would hope are off one of the internet time servers. And so really it shouldn't be an issue these days, but if it is, there's an INI for that. Uh, and then the bottom three are debugging, which I'm in the middle of doing, which we're going to get to in a, a minute or two, talking about some of that. So the last quarter or third of the session is really errors and hot fixes. These are things from real life that people have asked or I've had to deal with. And what's important is, is trying to keep a logic. So this came from uh, David Havlitz out of Seattle uh, in our forum post. And he was saying, you know, TOTP requires the ID vault to have the V12 design and running on a V12 server, which is true, right? Will this cause any problems for other servers that also have the ID vault, but have not been upgraded to V12? The answer is yes and no. HCL says it's fine. HCL is wrong, okay? It will not work. You will create all kinds of havoc and basically lock all your users out of your R9 domain if you're not careful. Can you do it? Sure. But in practice, my, my experience has been, it really gets real messy real fast. Um, the, while the ID vault can move, the old one is R9 or 10 or whatever, the new one must be 12. You can't let those replicate, but yet you need them to kind of replicate because you need all the people to stay in sync. So you have to be real careful if you want to do that on their selective replication. You can't just let it go, you know, everything replicate. Um, because both servers need to be 12, uh, the templates for ID vault and directory and DOM, DOM CFG. You can actually, if you had multiple R12 servers, you can have the ID vault on server A and TOTP configuration stuff on server B. That's fine because it's all R12, there's no issue. But in a mix R9 and 12, it's just not gonna happen. You're just gonna ask for trouble. So don't do that. Uh, ooh, somebody just wrote in the question, TOTP step size, not actually how long the fuck is it for? Second, that's an extra step size we have for the default of 60 second lifetime from time zero, not 30 seconds. When the steps allow before increasing so some TOTP apps don't support step size. Uh, okay, so David is correct, that's true. There is a, a breakdown of how the step size works, um, how long that token is valid for. Uh, which is interesting since I took that straight from the HCL docs, then what David wrote contradicts the HCL docs. So um, David, the ball's in your court to go fix those somewhere. Um, Cause I literally took it straight out of the docs. Like what's on that screen. Although I may not have explained it perfectly as well as you did. So I apologize for that. Um, but anyway, uh, so hot fix alert. There was a hot fix for a problem. If you had uh, DA running directory assistance and by, it would bypass the TOTP authentication. But there is a hot fix that came out post fix back one. And I would presume it's gonna be in 1202, which as we found out yesterday is gonna be coming out November 17th. 
So just for those people with the DA, be aware to make sure you test things properly of your DA if you're going to use it. Uh, so odd issue with uh, some environments. Uh, we had a client where everything seemed okay, but when we did the TOP configuration check, we got this object variable not set error, or we got there is no sign inform mapping. So the no sign inform mapping usually means the DOM CFG something's wrong. You maybe put bad syntax or whatever it might be. Uh, but the object variable said the only way to fix it was to go back and get a beta template for 1202 from HCL. So um, most likely that will be in 1202 and ready to go. And um, uh, yeah, I will try and figure out how, to, um, maybe if my uh, host helper can figure out how to get David's message into the rest of the chat for people to see it. I'm not sure how to do that from here. Okay. Okay. Thank you, David. Um, get to those. Let me try and get through the last few screens and then we can talk about that. Um, right. So this was a temporary, this was a directory template update. Only some customers have this problem. Others never saw it. No idea why we didn't get an update. Uh, token field missing. This came up in testing because basically what we found was if the templates weren't updated or if they had been updated, but replicated back one way or the other, then the field wasn't there to accept the token. There was nothing available. You would get this failed error and, and you were left trying to scratch your head to figure out. Uh, so in one case, we had uh, two references to TOT per server. It turned out they had torn down a box, rebuilt it, didn't notice that the name had changed, or didn't change, and it was a double reference. So one we took out and then we replaced the templates and the DOM CFG because R9 to R12, again, was very different and had different functions and aspects. Um, so that had to be updated. But if you get that message, it's usually because you've got a template issue. For those who haven't done TOTP, the first line on top here is how you start the process of the configuration, MFA management, create trust cert. The server console will say it worked. But when we did a show ID vault, as you can see on the left, you get the basic thing, but we were missing the part on the bottom, which says my domain trust, my domain for MFA, wouldn't come out. And when you look at the certificate list in the directory, it didn't show the MFA entry. We only had notes, certs, and vault certs. And it's only after we updated the, the 12 template again, actually, I think I got the beta one from the other client and loaded it back in, everything was fine. Uh, if you've got customers who have edited their uh, directory templates over the years, you have to be careful because a lot of times they have stuff set to not take any changes. And so although you may have put it to R12, it didn't get any of that because they blocked them out from replacing other information. And if you've got a new customer, sometimes they don't always tell you, so you don't know. That's the way it goes. Uh, so, okay, we're almost done. We got two slides on the Q Vault options. These are more information for people who need to query the ID Vault. Uh, the Dash P allows you to update user data, which I think going forward will probably become more important um, than maybe it had been in the past for the Vault users. Syntax is here, what to do with it. Um, you know, an example for it, you can do it for everybody or for one user, updates the ID file size and certificate, cert certificate expirations, uh, which is good, right? We need that, obviously, especially since everything in TOTP is ID vault based. The other one is when you've got inactive and, and re re -inacting the, uh, reactivating people. So seasonal employees, maybe like DR test users, whatever it might be, there's a way to actually do this and, and set it up so that you don't have to recreate the user. I think most companies, most places will end up recreating the users, but in a situation where you're using the same ones every time, this is a better way to go than having to rebuild them every time, right? So it's more like for, for large numbers, there's a better way to go. So these all both came out in 1201 uh, as far as updates on the ID Vault side. And as we get to the last like two minutes of this, uh, this is from my last, my customer right now. This is an open ticket. The customer TOTP has been running for a few months and the last week or two, they've started having people who are unable to set up the MFA. Um, when the IT guys try and do it for them, it seems fine. 
And the HCL support guys have said, we want the HAR file. Here's the how to get a HAR file. But the, the details on the web log look like this, and we just get 403 forbidden, and we haven't really come to a conclusion as to what's causing it. Historically, this is usually caused by timestamp differences, but we verified there are no timestamp issues. So we're still at a loss as to what's causing these people. Um, so far, nothing is matching, not people, not places, not things. We're kind of unsure where that's going. So it's frustrating. I was hoping to have an answer before the end of this episode, but no such luck. But hopefully I will someday. Okay, since we got about a minute left, um, so there's two slides here, which basically things people forget that they don't read about in the uh, client side. Some basic information about encrypted mail is not supported for TOTP authentication. Um, iOS mail client, HCL companion, um, things that just customers are not reading. So I put those here for people so they have it easy to use. And the other one is, once you turn on TOTP, you may or may not, depending on the device, have to reinstall first and, and update it for the changes that have occurred. Okay. And again, these are just basically straight out of the docs, nothing special, but want to make sure people know about them. The, this is a long list of links to both HCL um, docs, my blog post, uh, L's blog post as well, re regarding registering users with CSV, um, TOTP issues, and, and changing users and scripts and things like that. I just want to make sure people have a way to do it. So that's basically it. I pretty much have finished on the news. Um, it's you know a really different kind of session. I still don't know how I get David's session into here. I have no idea how to put that out. Um, for those on the Discord, I will try and, and copy that out so that we can uh, put it in the Discord and at least discuss it there. Uh, that's about the best I can do, I think, at the moment, because I have no idea how to get it there. Um, if there's any questions, I got like a minute or two, I can probably do it until they cut me off. Uh, let's see, Tristan says, I've been working with a customer on TOTP, ran into an issue where iPhones fail to scan the QR code with Duo or Google Authenticator. Is this something you've seen before? Uh, yeah, you can't set up TOTP the first time from a phone. You have to do it from a computer. Uh, this is also something people skip when they're reading how to. Um, there's no way to do it like initially from the phone. If you're talking about their first setting up Duo or Google Authenticator, that's a different discussion. Um, that usually should work. Um, all right, Kim wants me to try and read David's message. So I'm gonna try again. David originally said the TOTP step size is not actually how long the token is valid for. The second notes INI setting states how many extra steps the token is valid for. So the default result in 60 second lifetime from time zero, not 30 seconds. I suggest increasing the number of steps allowed before increasing the step size, as some TOTP apps don't support step size other than 30 seconds. Uh, and, and that's true. Um, that second INI setting was about the step size, which was related to the timing. Um, but I was talking about the time delay of the user being unable to, to put the MFA info in not the PC to server side, but either way, um, that, that's good clarity to explain the difference between them. So I hope um, that came out a little better, but I'll try and put, like I said, I'll try and post it on the Discord. So I'm sure my host is probably saying that we probably run out of time here. Yes, we have. Okay. Um, so hopefully everybody got something out of this. Thank you all for coming. Uh, I will be at, in the Discord for any further questions, or you can catch me at, uh, on Twitter at Lotus Evangelist or my email or one of the other thousand ways that I'm available online. So thank you everybody and enjoy the rest of the conference.